Jawa Mining on the fast track for cobalt production out of the USA. Simon, your company looks really interested, Jawa Mining. Uh, to me, it looks a little bit like an intercontinental cobalt play. So maybe elaborate a bit. Uh, three continents? Yes, so um, we, we set up Javois to be a multi-jurisdictional battery metal supplier. Um, and we looked at the market and decided, you know, there isn't a real institutional or investable cobalt specific play. Um, so we focus on cobalt, but we also have uh, lots of exposure to nickel and copper as well. And which jurisdiction, uh, which continent you are? Yeah, <laughs> so, 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 so we're in North America. There is no cobalt supply out of, uh, out of the US. And so we have what we believe is the, is the principal asset in the United States mm -hmm. and the asset that we can move into production quickly. Uh, we're also focused in Australia. Uh, we have a project called Nyko Young, which has been within Javois for several years. It's a large nickel laterite. Um, lots of potential for battery grade nickel and battery grade cobalt. And then we also believe that if you're going to be in the cobalt space, you have to have exposure to East Africa. 70% of the world's cobalt is But produced. not the DRC, right? Not the DRC. 70% um, of the world's cobalt comes from East Africa, mainly the DRC. Uh, we don't want to be in there. There's a number of reasons. It's a difficult jurisdiction, but there's no disputing the geology of East Africa. And if we're going to be a serious player in the cobalt market, we want to have exposure to that region. Mm, fantastic. So let's jump into the USA, because I think this is yeah, the, the project of choice, not only the flavor of the month, but this is the, uh, your wish for the next two years. You want to bring Idaho cobalt operations, of course, into production. So please give us an insight into that. How do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, a lot of people uh, around the world know this this project, it's been around for about 20 years since it's been worked up. Uh, a lot of people believe it should have been in production during the last cobalt cycle. Um, for a number of reasons, it, it wasn't brought into production. And that gave us the opportunity to acquire um, this asset through the merger with eCobalt earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the highest grades and the biggest resource in the US. And again, there is no production in the US right Super. now. And I think there was already a lot of money spent, right? There, it's, it, it's, as I said, it's been, in, it's been in existence for over 20 years that it's been developed and there's been over, there's been over $100 million US put into this project. Um, so it's actually a partially complete mine, which again, in terms of we were able to merge with the Cobalt for roughly 30 million Canadian. Wow. And so we you, ended up with you a partially complete You paid 30 cents mine. for the dollar, right? Yeah. That's effectively, not too bad, yeah, I would say. yeah, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. So you said in two years you want to be in production. How much money is needed? Well, uh, we're doing our own bankable feasibility, mm -hmm. but the estimate that Ecobalt had was it would be another eighty million dollars to bring this mine into production. Mm -hmm. We think we can potentially reduce that by simplifying the flow sheet. Mm -hmm. And a number of different steps, but even but if it's it hypothetical is, by now, even course. if it is eight, 80 million mm -hmm. for us to do, uh, it's we believe it's eminently financeable with a mix of debt and equity. Mm -hmm. Fantastic! So that would be then like the first real cobalt production out of the U.S., right? Exactly. There is no U.S. production right now, which, which when you consider how important how, and how strategic cobalt is in the world, and the U.S. has designated it a, a, cri a critical metal. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of talk in uh, North America right now about the U.S. trying to catch up with the uh, Chinese in terms of refined cobalt. Mm -hmm. And obviously having production domestically would be a big step in that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So let's move uh, to Australia, I would say, the Nyko Young project. Please give us an insight there. Because uh, to, for me, it looks like a bit the more distant future of the company, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of large uh, nickel laterite projects in Australia. Um, you know, a lot of people may have heard of um, Cleantech. It's a Robert Friedland company that has had a market valuation of three quarters of a billion Australian at certain points, obviously in, in the recent months with cobalt falling somewhat from its highs, um, the, 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 the price of e-cobalt's come off somewhat, but it's still a large project. So within Javois, we have a very similar asset. The difference for us is we don't believe there's as much technical risk. This is an asset we can use a, a 
heat bleach process to recover, mm -hmm. whereas for a lot of those nickel laterites, they have more complicated means of recovery. They typically use high-powered acid leach, mm -hmm. which we wouldn't have to do. So lower technical risk, still large capex, but lower than, uh, than most of these projects would mm -hmm. have. So exactly, that's further down the road, of exactly. course. And you would produce the nickel and cobalt. Do I get that right? Nickel and cobalt. Okay. And both would be battery grade, which is a big distinction for a number of the nickel mines around the world and in places like Indonesia. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, for us and for people who are interested in this, there's a lot of interest from end users, from battery manufacturers, from car manufacturers, because they're looking to lock up the supply of nickel and cobalt in the future for batteries. Fantastic. Now let's move to Africa. And of course, we see here already a drill rig of yours. Yep. And uh, yeah, Uganda, you are working in Uganda. This is from where you came, from M2 Cobalt. You were the former CEO bef uh, before the merger happened yep. with Shawa. So what's the project about here? So, I, I mean, as I said, uh, said at the top, um, if you're going to be a, a, a cobalt company, our view is you need to have exposure to the geology of East Africa. Again, we don't want to be in the DRC as such, where most of the world's cobalt comes from. So we've chosen Uganda. Um, Uganda is a highly underexplored country in a phenomenally geologically rich um, region. Uh, we know from previous uh, production in Uganda at the, uh, the Kalimbe mine, which is a historic mine there, that the geological trends from the DRC don't stop at the border. They cross into Uganda. There was significant copper and cobalt produced in the day. And it's a wonderful place for us to explore, but also look at potentially, uh, you know, assisting the government in a restart of the Kalimbe mine and helping to develop a battery metals hub. In, uh, in Uganda, which we think has potential. Yeah, absolutely. And I also found in your presentation uh, a refinery. What is about this? Yeah, so this is actually five miles from the old mine. Um, in the late 90s, SG Bateman built a refinery. Um, it was built to process the tailings um, that were produced at uh, Kalimbe. When, when Falcon Bridge produced copper, they produced cobalt as well as a byproduct, but people weren't looking for cobalt. Uh, in the 50s to 70s, and so they just stockpiled it. And so this plant was set up to process those tailings, and they, produce, they processed a number of the primary tailings, but not the secondary tailings. And so this infrastructure is five miles away. It's uh, been islanded for several years. Mm -hmm. It's on care and maintenance. Mm -hmm. it's, actually, um, it's actually a pretty good facility, and we believe has the potential to be reinvigorated and expanded to help, uh, as I say, turn Uganda into a hub for battery metals. Mm -hmm, fantastic, but you are owning that or you are in the process no. to work with it? Then? No, in Uganda, we have a number of uh, really highly strategic um, and prospective exploration licenses. And we're in discussions with the government about becoming involved in a restart of the Kalembe mine and also a restart of the uh, KCCL uh, refinery. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well then, Simon, thank you very much. All the best uh, with your multinational jurisdictions and projects. And I would say bring Idaho in production because that's what the US really needs, the car makers need and the battery makers, right? Thanks, Jochen. Absolutely. That's going to be our focus. Yeah. But we believe there's lots of additional upside potential as we move forward here and, you know, with cobalt needing more and more sources of supply. Yeah. Fantastic. So we're excited. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it was the Executive General Manager Corporate Affairs of uh, Jawa, Simon Clark. And you heard it, uh, Jawa. It looks like yeah, a real cobalt conglomerate for the future, working in Australia, working in East Africa, Uganda, and also very important in the US. And they are on track, really, to get the first cobalt uh, production out of the US, really into production. And uh, the company has enough money to do that so far. Of course, they need to do a project finance, but $80 million, I think that seems to me really manageable around. And uh, I would suggest you check out the company. I'm your host, Jochen Steiger, Commodity TV, in partnership with Dukas Copy TV. Thanks for watching us and bye-bye from Geneva. <laughs>